All right, so the previous problem was this one. This is part two. Previous problem was, previous problem was this one. And we finished, and uh, we found the power developed by the turbine, which depends not only on properties of the inlet and the exit of the turbine, because we can find an enthalpy, which is flow work plus internal energy at each inlet and exit, but it also depends on m dot, and it makes sense. If I have large m dot, I have more power. If I have small m dot, I have less power, okay? So as you can see in this problem, you know, the, the what we practice here mostly was using the tables because once we have the governing equations, okay, like the equations that we'll use for the heat exchanger and the equations that we'll use for the turbine, then we need to find out the properties so we can use those governing equations. And in order for us to do that, we need to know how to use the tables, okay? Now, the second problem is mostly conceptual. The second problem is this one, and you'll find that on your notes. And for that second problem, it says that turbines are used to help generate power because you typically have a generator uh, connected to it, so it's not just a turbine. And as we know, the energy will decrease when you go from the inlet to the exit of the turbine. Now, the pressure typically decreases dramatically, like we saw in the previous problem, that it went from 3 megapascals, which is 3,000 kilopascals, to 75 kilopascals. And that is a big jump, okay? So sometimes, instead of doing that, we have several stages. And you'll see that with microlitis when you move forward, okay? You have several stages and um, this one I have here. Yeah, so instead of just having one, we have multiple stages. Now, the one that you see here, the next problem, has um, two expansion stages and we wanna find three different equations that will be useful to find H6. And I gave you all the numbers everywhere. So I have H6 over here at the exit of the mixer. If you look at it, you have a turbine. And then it moves on to another one. But instead of just moving on to that one, because we have this two over here, is another exit of the turbine, okay? You have some bleeding because you still have high energy. And I want to mix it here from this low, lower energy fluid that I have over here. And then here I have a pump. So I can mix it with this high energy before it moves on to something else. Okay, so you'll see like why we have why we have them connected a certain way. This sign is not trivial later. But assuming that this is a design, we want to have multiple equations for H6. Now I think I told them on that exam to get to write three different equations. This is one of those problems where as long as six is crossing the boundary that you choose. That's fine, okay? Now this problem, if you look at the solution, there are a lot of different m dots written on the solution because the m dots are not the same. In this case, I have that m dot one, it will separate into two, okay? And uh, I did not name that state or that region between the turbines. I did not give it a number, that was my bad. Um, but m dot two, plus m dot three that's coming around, all right? After the mixture, it will be m dot six. And m dot one and m dot six are the same, but it's breaking up into two parts, okay? So then I just drew it again in a very fancy way. I have the two turbines. I have that sum of the water. This is water. It doesn't say some of your substance going into turbine one, it will just leave into the mixer. So then as long as I have six, Crossing my boundary, that's fine. So I could use a mixer, for example. I think that's the first one that I have in the solution. If I just choose a mixer, I have energy in, it was energy out, okay? If I just choose a mixer, I have uh, m.2h2 plus m.5h5, m.6h6, okay? If I choose a mixer and the pump, let's say, okay? So it will be you can practice it on your own. Just mixer and pump. That will be my boundary. I still have six coming out, but then I have two going in. Five is no longer crossing that boundary. I have four going into that system that I chose with the dashed lines, and I have the power of the pump going in. That's the second equation that you see there, okay? 
What about that third one? That third one says M.686 coming out. It has power of the turbine coming out. And then it has two going in, three going in, and power of the pump going in. Where do you think that is? Right? If you look at it, okay? This third one over here. It doesn't have four, it doesn't have five. All right? It means that those are either not part of my system at all, or, or the system that I chose, or they are inside of your system, okay? So that one looks like I crossed here, but I have the pump, so I was crossing around here, and then around here, see? So then I have six going out, two going in, three going in, work going out, work of the pump going in. The thing is you're just gonna choose your boundary such that that is crossing the boundary, and then you're gonna be very careful, okay? For example, this one that you see that I chose over here, this one like this. It has one going in, and here it looks like the dash line is like conveniently has the power of the turbine one like this. Well, that one is not going into anything else inside of my system. That one still is crossing the boundary. So does that make sense? As long as it's not going into another one of your systems inside, it is going out, and I'm pretty sure this is the last one over here, okay? I have six going out, I have turbine one going out, turbine two going out, I have four going out, so the one that's like this on the paper, and then I have one going in, and I have five going in. This one, we're not crossing the boundary at all, okay? Doesn't mean that it doesn't affect it, because this difference between four and five will be equal to that, but it's not crossing the boundary, okay? So that one is good practice, but it's conceptual and doesn't have any numbers. That was, I'm a little dizzy now from the moving. All right, so that's problem number two. So now I'm gonna start problem number three, last one, yeah. Okay. Problem number three is this one over here, the right? So it's supposed to be online. So this one says, am I even recording? Oh, thank goodness. That one says you have a, a gas turbine, which is a little diagram you have over there, okay? You may model this with this after a lot of simplifications. And that is the Brayton cycle, which I think is the last thing you guys will cover with Nicolaitis. And the Brayton cycle is that. That's it. Not bad, right? So Brayton cycle, you see you have a compressor, a heat exchanger, turbine, and another heat exchanger. And then there's that shaft between the turbine and the compressor. It just means that some of the power of the compressor, that some of the power that the turbine is generating is used to drive the compressor. And the rest of it, which is going to be greater than what the compressor requires, it's something that you're going to use. Now, what's happening there is that you have air at ambient conditions at one, as you'll study in the Brayton cycle. You're going to compress it, and then you're going to heat it up, all right? This is a model, so that's not exactly what's happening because you have combustion. So now it's going to be compressed, it's going to be hot, it's going to be, you know, like a, a lot of extreme values of properties, yeah, high temperature, high pressure. And then you're going to pass it through the turbine or turbines, typically multiple stages. You get work out, and then because it's a cycle, you want to bring it back, or this is a closed Brayton cycle, not closed system then you need a heat exchanger so some of that energy leaves your system and then you can bring it back to its original temperature okay so then it tells you that once you study the Brayton cycle later um let's see if with our knowledge of open systems and finding properties we can solve this problem it says that the compressor requires work the figure two which is what you have over here right there it shows that uh the turbine is driving the compressor, but you just may assume that each one is individual. Compressor requires power, turbine gets power out. And then for the ideal Brayton cycle, you are going to assume that the air is a working substance, which is not what's happening in reality, that it behaves as an ideal gas, and that each component has the assumptions that are available to you on that handout that you have for open system. The heat exchanger, um, doesn't have change in velocity, that the compressor doesn't have heat losses, and so on. Now, something different from what you've seen, because that one says a heat exchanger, like a whole heat exchanger with Q in and a whole heat exchanger with Q out, so that can be confusing, but in reality, that is a section of a heat exchanger, okay? So that should be on the problem statement, and it isn't. That is a section of a heat exchanger with the Q in, 
right? Going from one stream to the other. That's why you have that queue in. Okay, very important. Otherwise, we just have my entire heat exchanger with an additional queue in. That's not what's happening here. Okay. So here we have all this information, and then we just go one line at a time, so we're not overwhelmed. It says that T1 is given 300 Kelvin. Great. I know this is air in an ideal gas, so I know already that I can find H1. Perfect. It tells you the specific work that the compressor requires also given. It tells you T4. Great. I can find H4. So happy. It's 770 Kelvin. Then it tells you the ratio of allometric flow rate from 3 to 2. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that the mass flow rate is going to be uh, from 3 to 2. The ratio is going to be that. Right? Mass flow rate is going to be the same. 1, 2, 3, 4 because it stays safe. Now you want to find T2, T3. Specific work that we get out of the turbine, specific Q in, specific Q out. Assuming variable specific heat and constant specific heat. Now at 300 Kelvin, important. That second part, that's to get you used to it. This is going to be called cold air Brayton cycle. When you assume every constant specific heat at 300 Kelvin. Now I gave you a bunch of equations that have CV and CP. Um, he will also use K. I want to say he, I mean Dr. Mikulaitis. And K is CP over CV. So there will be some new equations maybe that he will give you because K is CP over CV. And in addition to that, CV plus R is CP. So you can just manipulate them and get K into that equation too. But, it, but this is still the same equation. It's just that it has K there. Okay. If you have a question, you can ask me or you can ask him. He's great. Okay. So we're going to solve it in two ways, and it's solved, all right? It's, it's posted, so you don't have to watch the rest. You can just go through this if you want, okay? All right, so I have three more minutes. Give me one second here. Let's see. I'm getting a message here. Give me one second. Um going on here okay all right so I'm gonna start the problem and then I think there will be another video with the rest of it just again you don't have to watch these because now they're just examples now for variable specific heat I'm gonna solve the whole thing and then cost specific heat at 300 Kelvin because this is important that you know it and here we are solving the Brayton cycle we don't really know what's going on very well because this is what you'll cover at the end, but we are solving part of it. The last part that you will learn with Nicolaitis is how to incorporate this changing entropy, okay? When we have an isentropic process, it will be reversible, which you will learn has to do with ideal and no, no losses due to friction and so on. It will also be adiabatic. So some of those processes, like the compressor and the turbine, you'll say, if it's isentropic, if it's constant entropy, which is another property you can find from the tables, then I get this amount of work in or out. That you incorporate that into this, that's it. All right, that's what's left. So the first part um, is asking for T2. Now, to find T2, we could use ideal gas equation of state. We could use the equation for the dot. There are several ways not to find T2, but we're going to look at what we have given, and we have T1, and then we have energy from 1 to 2, okay? So the specific work of the compressor from 1 to 2 is H2 minus H1, because that is the power divided by M dot, okay? It means that I can find H2 with H1 and work of the compressor. And if I can find H2, I can go to the tables and find T2, all right? So now just by looking at the problem... I need to figure out how I will go ahead and solve for the property that is asking for because now we have multiple equations. So I say H2 is W of, of the compressor plus H1. I can find H1 from the tables at 300 Kelvin, and then you do that at A17. So I solve for H2. And again, why am I solving for H2? Because now I can go to the tables and solve for T2 or look for T2, which is what I'm going to do. When I go to A17 with H2, anything on that row corresponds to that state, including the temperature, I see that that value of H2 is not there, so I have to interpolate, and that will be the beginning of the last video coming up.